Uh, I've been in uh, enough sessions now that uh, just present the entire time that we really wanted to try to change that for this session. So I've asked the participants to, to shorten their presentations as much as possible. We'd really ideally have about half of the time to interact and to have discussion as a, as a group, which means there is a burden on you. Come up with questions. Think of things that uh, you really would like answered from this group or from others in the session. So we'd, we'd really ideally be learning from each other and, and hearing uh, challenges, uh, good lessons, uh, ways to do this. So my very brief intro to this session is just that about 10 years ago, when I was starting as the product manager for Tracker, uh, we had a handful of countries, a handful of implementations. The use case was not entirely clear yet. And at this point, there are now 80 plus countries that use it, many of them as national systems. Uh, and it ranges from everything that is, you know, a two clinic kind of system to something that is entirely managing their entire primary health care. So it's, it's a wide variety of implementations being used now for schools, being used for supply chain. Uh, there's many ways that the tracker data model and the, the tracker application are being used by your groups. And what I was hoping for from the session is great presentations uh, from groups that have been successful at scaling it, uh, the, the wizards of uh, health information systems that have made this work. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing how they've got it to scale where they are. Uh, some of the challenges they faced and how they've overcome them. And then we'll open it up for a, a good long discussion after that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over first to uh, Gideon. Yeah. Uh, from Ghana. Where did the mouse go? There it is. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Can you hear me? All right. Um, my name is Gideon Sapo Inamiche, based in Ghana, and um, I'm the technical project manager, Digital Squared Path, and um, I lead our digital innovation in pandemic control project. For short, it's called um, DIPC. I'll be spending a few minutes to talk about our work um, on enhancing the DHIS2 base tracker for immunization services in Ghana. I'll be doing this presentation with um, my big brother here, Kwame, but um, from Ghana Health Service. Um, but he has asked me to, to lead the, the presentation and speak about the processes and all the technical questions that you have, he will be happy to, to answer them. And of course, we also have a full representation um, from our colleagues, HIFS Ghana, um, who will also be here to support, to answer all the digital and technical questions that you may have around this project. So you may probably have heard of Digital Square, but to those that are hearing this for the first time, um, Digital Square is actually within PATH, and um, you can think of Digital Square as where all digital services happen um, within PATH itself. And we have a wide range of technical expertise, um, working across different domains. We work with countries, we work with donors, we work with, in fact, we work with everybody. And um, our focus primarily is to also ensure we advocate for um, open source digital health solutions. In November, 2022, we partnered with um, GIZ to initiate our DIPC project um, in, in three different countries, Ghana, Malawi, Tanzania. And our main focus was to create um, a more resilient health systems for us to prepare for. We are not hoping for the next pandemic, but nobody knows. But it's, it's important for us to prepare ourselves and, have, and ensure that we have a more resilient systems in place. Um, how did we do this? We, we started the whole process by ensuring that we are aligning with um, the government and I must say that if you really want to start any digital solution in Ghana and you want to tread the, the path of frustration, then you can go ahead and do whatever you want to do by sidelining the, the Ghana Health Service team. But for us, we, we initiated by um, engaging the right stakeholders within the Ghana Health Service. And we came up with these three um, key prioritized areas. But for the purpose of this presentation, we are going to focus on the first um, work stream. 
you will bear with me that um, if you want to implement any digital um, national skill system, it is also important for you to align with global standards. So um, we adopted the WHO Smart Guideline Initiative, but I want you to focus on the second layer, which is the operational level, where we adapted the digital adaptation kits, and these are human readable um, requirements and we were able to generate um, and adopt the generic requirements that um, came out of the digital adaptation kits. How did we go by um, the localization process? Um, we um, involved a couple of processes by having consultation sessions um, with key stakeholders within the, the Ghana Health Service. And of course, we also did a bit of desk reviews and we also interviewed key partners, um, that is the expanded program on immunization across each region to understand the systems and the digital tools that they used for immunization services. And those informed us, the feedback that we got informed us to know the gaps that existed. And for every um, immunization registry, these are the functional components that you should have. So out of the, um, the landscaping exercise we did, these uh, were the area, the map, the, the arrow that is showing red, we realized that those were the gaps that we needed to um, work on to enhance the system so that we can better provide better services for the clients. So um, these are the key um, functionalities that we worked on. Um, we touched on the stock management, um, the ability to also report adverse events and um, co-chain storage functionality is also embedded. And we also enhanced um, some of the data elements um, within the, the existing tracker. The scope of this project is, is actually big. Um, we are looking at deploying this enhanced solution within eight regions out of 16 across 100 districts. Um, we also plan to um, Use this, this system is going to be used by approximately 11,000 healthcare workers and health managers. And of course, you bear with me that once you will enhance any system, it's also important for you to build the capacity of the end users. So we are going to train about 7,000 plus um, health workers across 3,700 um, health facilities. But in terms of the clients that are going to be managed on the system, we are looking at about 300,000 clients that's going to be managed on this particular enhanced system. Um, the level of users for this um, enhanced system, it's going to cut across all the level of care. And um, so through the facility level to the national level, we are going to have users using the system across all these levels. The localized version of the digital adaptation kit is actually published. Um, and uh, these are the key um, functionalities or components within the document, but for the purpose of time, I wouldn't want to go through. Um, we, we are available to share with you copies of that document um, for, for, for you to also look at it in detail. So we have different components, process flows, data elements, functional elements, all embedded in the localized version of the, the DAC. A few things that we learned um, out of this process. Um, although we know that WHO is still in the process of analyzing the digital adaptation case for immunization, but um, we adopted the, the DAC framework and we call the DAC framework to develop our own system um, user requirements documents. Um, and um, we had different workshops across all these countries to understand and to be able to localize um, the digital abduction kits for each country. Um, and I must say the system user requirements that we localized has been adopted as the official document that has been used um, or that is in use for the enhancement of immunization systems. And one key thing that I would like to highlight is that the whole development process was quite quick and, and more streamlined because we already had um, generic kind of solutions for you to work out of. So it made the process very quick and uh, I was really marveled how quick the, the team were able to, to produce high quality deliverables within um, a very short time frame. And one other thing that we also realized across all the countries was that um, 
we saw that almost all the functionalities and the requirements across countries were, were pretty the same. So it, is, it means that to, to even make it more easier for developers, if you want to adopt the, the tool to, to your own country, um, it, the, the amount of localization will be minimized because it's, the requirements are pretty easier across board. For the lessons we learned out of the development process, I know the HIPS team will, will speak a little more about that if you have questions later on. But one key thing that I have mentioned this already was that the development process was quite quick. And for transparency issues, um, they were able to give, um, I mean, credentials to the right people that needs to test the system to ensure that all the functionalities that needed to be there, which is the EPI um, national team, they gave them access to really test the system to, to give feedback um, for them to work on. And um, one other thing that probably if you want to uh, adopt and go through this same route, um, some of the requirements are pretty at a very high level. And um, things like um, setting up validation rules and all, you have to work with the developers to, to have that in. And um, finally, um, I would also say that um, the DAC includes all requirements and the work is still needed in terms of prioritization for us, we excluded um, this particular functionality, which is the ability to notify clients. Um, but that was out of scope of the work we did. But of course, if it, it depends on you what, what you want to do and what you want to adapt based on the resources that you have. So I will end here with um, a very big thank you to our HIST team. And Kwame, thank you so much for all the, all the work you've done. Great, thank you so much. Um, and again, please be thinking of questions, feel free to write them down. We're, we'll go through all of the presentations in the first half and then we'll have more discussion. So the, the next two presentations are coming from Pakistan. They're a quite interesting case of a public-private approach. Um, so we'll start first hearing from uh, the Na Ministry of National Health Services uh, from Pakistan on their TB system. And I'm gonna try to move this thing somewhere else. Sure, do your best. Uh, absolutely, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, okay, I hope I'm very loud and clear. Okay, um, I welcome you um, for this session on uh, large scale implementations and uh, uh, moving forward. Like, we on behalf of uh, Pakistan, what we have done with DHIS2 in terms of large scale implementations. Um, when it comes to large scale implementations, we are talking about diseases that have large scale impact. Uh, one of the diseases is tuberculosis. We have others as well, malaria, HIV AIDS, but we are gonna focus on our implementation that we have done in the country uh, in terms of tuberculosis. Okay, so moving forward uh, at Pakistan, uh, with working with Ministry of National Health Services, what we're trying to achieve is uh, four areas uh, in terms of tuberculosis, when you are talking about the disease, we are doing the screening, the diagnosis, the treatment, and the monitoring. These are the areas that we are covering uh, in terms of patient care. So, um, okay, uh, that's the first thing. And when we are talking about large-scale implementations and we are talking about health systems and we are talking about tuberculosis, so some things come into mind, like what are the basic pillars that we need to focus on? So the first pillar is data. We, have, we need to know what kind of data we are dealing with. Uh, we need to know what kind of systems we are dealing with to gather, gather that data. The third thing with, that we need to deal with is what kind of logistics is available to us when we are talking about large-scale implementations. And the fourth thing, the human resource. Whenever these four things are available to you, then you can do a large-scale implementation. Otherwise, they, you will be facing some challenges. So I'm gonna talk about what challenges we faced in Pakistan when we were trying to implement uh, digitalization of tuberculosis case-based system in the country uh, in terms of these four pillars. So keep in mind that the slide, I'm gonna move forward quickly because my colleagues from the private sector, they are gonna present as well. 
and I'm going to focus on the public sector implementation of the health system. So uh, the first slide that you see, I'm going to uh, just looking at the amount of data that is coming in. This is a microscopy 1400,000 and expert 950,000 in a year. We are talking just a year. So culture 63,000 and DST 500, 5,552. This is the amount of data that is coming in every year. And just to add to it, the number of notifications, 482 per year. And then if you are talking about TB, we are talking about drug susceptible and the drug resistant TB. So we are having 3,000, approximately 3,000 cases per year. This is the amount of data that we are dealing with at the moment. Next, the first pillar is done. The amount of data that is coming in is huge. We are, again, in Pakistan, you are familiar, we are the fifth largest population, which is going to be explained further. And uh, keeping this in mind and the data that is coming in, what are the systems that are available in the country? So we have, again, focusing on tuberculosis, we have National Reference Laboratory. We have the lab component. Initially, we discussed we have four components, screening, diagnosis. So all these components, they have their individual information system in the country. Uh, we have expert results. We have aggregate surveillance information system, that is DHIS2. We have a training portal for doctors to get trained on TB. We have a helpline that helps uh, uh, deal us with technical calls from the uh, health facilities. We have um, ECBS modules. We have warehouse management system. My colleague earlier was talking about the logistics part. Then we have case-based surveillance system in the country. And then for MDRTB, we have another surveillance system. So there are many systems in the country. Uh, moving forward, when did our digitalization journey begin? Uh, we started back in 2017, again, with the WHO standard uh, tools that was aggregate tool. Whenever you're talking about large scale implementations, you do don't directly go to gay space implementation. First, you have to start from the aggregate reporting to see what you're capable of, what you can um, do with the systems that you have with DHIS2. We started with uh, the aggregate module back in 2018 with the WHO standard tools. And then um, we did the training in the country. Um, there were 533 healthcare workers that were trained. And again, once you set up a health information system, you have to deal with the uh, technicalities as well. You will be receiving calls that, okay, our system is not working and users will be complaining you need to have uh, someone at the front line dealing with all that calls that is coming to you. So we had a helpline set up for that particular purpose. Then we didn't jump right into the case-based system. We did pilot and we did testing of smallest case-based uh, systems. We did mandatory case notification. We learned from that. We did a pilot in a region in Islamabad in federal, and uh, that was done in 2021. Finally, we were prepared for a complete rollout in the country in 2022, where we did trainings in all parts of the country, um, both in public and the private sector. Uh, our colleagues will be explaining that further. Uh, now we have that part completed. What we are going to do next is we are focusing on integrations with the existing system. So what are the systems we have? We're going to push them in to the DHIS2, not push them in, but we're going to integrate with them. You, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So, and then once you have the systems that are coming in, we focus on the dashboards so that we can make the use of information. As you can see further, this is a landscape of what information that is coming in. We had number of cases we discussed earlier. I'm going to just move forward and we have some discussion time. These are some glimpses from the integrated dashboards that we have um, available. Um, and the country, this is a map of a uh, country presenting the data that is being presented, the notifications of tuberculosis. There are many more maps on the dashboards available. Okay, so we have talked about the systems, the second pillar. Now we're gonna talk about the third thing, the logistics, the hardware. When we are talking about large scale implementations, we have to keep in mind that you will need a good amount of resource in terms of hardware. We are talking about servers, we are talking about laptops or mobiles. We need to be uh, prepared to deal with that uh, in, in keeping in that in mind. So in Pakistan, what we have is we have two of uh, two servers available to us, top of the line AMD servers, 
Uh, I will not go into technical details, but uh, just to show you, um, we have 128 cores of CPU available to us with uh, more than um, 128 plus 256 plus 512 gigs of RAM. So it's enough to run uh, three surveillance systems, but it is all available to us for one surveillance system. And uh, again, uh, we have been uh, talking about backups. So all this system is linked to daily backup that is scripted and it's done over the night. So that is a glimpse of the structure that we have placed in Pakistan at this moment in time, where all this information uh, is coming in, is a large scale implementation. Again, it's not just the servers, not the hardware. We're also talking about firewalls, keeping uh, unauthorized access limited and blocking everything else other than the required information. So our information stays secure. So just to keep in mind, this is just a diagram of what we are dealing with. Okay, the last pillar, the human resource. It is very important. Uh, it's not just DHIS2, it's not just hardware, it's the people who are also there. So you have to invest in, in that part as well. Um, we have a frontline uh, helpline available to us. The, where the staff is continuously communicating with more than um, 1,000 users at the moment. We are uh, planning to scale it up to uh, other 15,000 users. Then we have coordinators coordinating with the end users, the field staff, to make sure that the data is entered in the system. It's a human nature. If we are not pushed, we become, become lazy. So if a system is good, uh, but the end users are not good enough, they are lazy, they are not performing, the system will collapse over time. It will not be reliable. So keeping in mind, when we are talking about good systems, we have to make sure the end users are being pushed every other day or every other week, so we can have a good quality of data. Then we have a strong team uh, of uh, system customization experts, developers. Um, those are continuously helping in, in terms of customizing the uh, forms that we have. And one more thing, uh, just I'm gonna point out over here, is that uh, one, when it comes to customization, uh, you have to keep in mind that every year or every second year, the, the recording tools get changed based on some new interventions that get defined in the program. So it is very important that your health system, whatever you're developing, is, is up to date. And that, for that, you need to engage uh, the customization teams, the software engineers. They, they're going to uh, keep it up to date based on the interventions that are coming in and the recording tools that get updated over time. Uh, then again, we have a strong IT team. Obviously you have seen the structure in order to make sure that we have the servers up and running, we have everything aligned, we have the firewalls up to date, we have the backups regularly and, uh, and continuously accessible DHIS2 everywhere in the country. So you need to have a strong IT team to make sure that the system is available 24 seven. Um, last month we had 99.9% .9 up and time available thanks to our uh, IT team. So if you are uh, uh, uploading this a uh, whole DHIS2 um, on a premises and you are hosting it there, you have to make sure that uh, it stays up and running 24 seven. Uh, otherwise you will get complaints from your field staff that the system is not up, that the system is not running. They will lose trust and they will definitely will not be using even if it's DHIS2 or any other system. So there are multiple angles associated with this. And one last thing that is very important is the commitment of the management, of the government, of uh, the high management people uh, to make sure that the data, the systems, they are used properly and everyone is committed in using that system. It's not just we have this DHIS2, we have customized it and we're gonna use it. Um, it's the commitment from the government part and from the private part as well, private sector as well. We need to ensure that this system is being used and they, the push from the government is very important in order to make sure that it is being used continuously. So the last slide, uh, what challenges we have faced and uh, these are the important ones. I think uh, this will be our point of discussion uh, in, in the coming minutes. Transition to paperless recording and reporting. That is the first point. Now we have the system. What we are gonna do with it? What's about the paper base? When are we gonna 
um, close it and we're going to move towards complete digitalization. That is a big question that will come to you when you're talking about large scale implementations. So uh, smooth transition is very important and uh, we are planning on that. Uh, then when we are talking about large scale systems, we have centralized organizational unit management for the whole country, 10,000 plus organization units. So it's a bit difficult when you have organization units with same names, it gets problematic. So a centralized organization unit repository is very important. When we are talking about organizational units, we are talking about user management. So uh, having organization units more, with more than 10,000 individuals entering data over there, it's very important that uh, we manage this user management accordingly. So keeping that in mind, adding these users uh, when you're uh, deploying this in the field, it's very important that uh, you have some sort of software engineers available to you that can do the uploading as well of these users, uh, especially using the DHS2 API. Uh, it will help you in uh, moving forward quickly with the uh, training and all that stuff. Uh, then we have uh, integration with existing systems in the country. As I talked earlier, we have multiple systems in the country. Uh, it's not just we want to reinvent the wheel, we want to do integrations as well, right? So every system that is running there, it should be at its potential, so it should be integrated with rather than we force them to uh, adopt our system. So integration will become a challenge once we are talking about large scale implementations. Uh, and one more thing I would like to add over here is when you're talking about integration, it's not simple. You have to make sure that it's continuous. It's a process. If one system gets changed, you will have to make sure that integration process is updated. And if the other pro uh, system gets changed, again, you have to monitor the process. Uh, the last, second last thing is the data completion and validation requires strong and consistent coordination. We have this uh, large scale implementation available. We have the DHIS2, we have everything now. But what about the data that is coming in? Is it being validated? Is it reliable? Is it credible? Do we have the monitoring teams in place to make sure that this is done properly? So this is some uh, question that needs answering. And you have to be prepared in terms of uh, processes. Uh, your monitoring and, uh, monitoring and planning checklist should be updated with this process. So how you have to keep in mind uh, that it has to be followed. And it has to be from the commitment of the national and the provincial and or regional in your cases uh, to the health facility. Uh, Last but not least, staff turnover requires continuous capacity building for consistent reporting. We have the system, we have the logistics, we have the human resource, but staff do does turnover over the time. What do we do about that? We need to, we can't do refreshers or trainings every year or every second year to, the, to mass audiences. It requires uh, logistics, it requires money, it requires funding. You can focus on like uh, online tool, like we have DHIS2, we have courses, we have um, certificates. We can use those means to make sure that the staff is trained and up to date on the use of the system. They can enter data properly. If it's garbage in, then it will be garbage out, even if you use DHIS2 or any other means. So make sure that the staff is trained on a regular basis. So finally, you need a support from your government as well as the donors to make this all possible. In Pakistan, um, we have been very fortunate that we had Global Fund, WHO, we have USAID, we have Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we have Mercy Corps, definitely, and we have GSI and University of Oslo, as always, we have support from his to make sure that this thing is there. So it's not just one thing, this is a whole team working together to make sure that we have an implementation of a disease in the country. Thank you so much. I would like to switch over to private sector for the implementation. Great, thank you so much. So now we'll be hearing also from a colleague from Mercy Corps with, that's been working with the private sector and combining with these TB systems. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, Fa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Azar Ayub, and I am from Mercy Corps, Pakistan. Uh, as you can see, we are presenting the two presentations, and we are talking about the large scale tracker. So we are implementing in the private sector, as far mentioned, they are in the public sector. So you can see, uh, if we start our journey, as far just mentioned about the, we were talking about the Pakistan, the large scale, the, 
you can see uh, Pakistan, this is country in the South Asia, the fifth most populous country in the world with over 241.5 uh, million population and Pakistan ranks fifth in also the TB burden countries in the world. Uh, you can see in uh, two, 2022 incident and a mortality rate per one 100,000 population were 258, and the mortality was 20, respectively. And it's from the cases from about 600,000 cases per year. And we can see the notifications are 4,200 cases in 2022. So you can assume how much the TB burden is from Pakistan. And in the upcoming slides, I will talk about the burden that private sector is having. Uh, so if I uh, talk about the little background from the private sector, the Mercy Corps worked in the tuberculosis since uh, 2002, and uh, it's the, now the principal recipient of Global Fund and the Pakistan, and we have almost, uh, we have eight partners that are implementing with us in the Pakistan. Uh, in Pakistan, I'll, if you, we have from a study, we can uh, see that 70% of the population in Pakistan they are seeking the medications, the medical treatment from the private sector. So it needs, uh, we have, it, it, it was needed that with the public sector, we should also go into the private sector to find the cases of the TB patients. Uh, so you can, for this purpose, we have, uh, uh, the, uh, the Mercy Corps has launched with the Global Fund, the help support of the Global Fund, the private, the private sector. Uh, the recording and the reporting tools before the 2018 were the, on the paper based, and the 2018 that's also mentioned that they had just started the aggregate data into the DHIS2, and after that, the tracker based uh, data comes in. If you can see the overview of the program, so we have we are implementing the DHIS2 TB tracker in 120 districts of Pakistan with the 14,000 general practitioners uh, GPs and the 4,000 plus large private hospitals. If we talk about the users, we have almost 500 plus field staff and the 100 plus program staff, they are also supporting their field staff and supervising them in their data, data maintenance. Uh, donors, if we talk about the donors, we have a global fund that is, uh, that is our uh, primary donor who is funding about funding for the TV program in Pakistan in the private sector and also the public sector as well. But Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has come over the uh, Global Fund grant to digitalize all the TB cases in Pakistan. And if we, uh, if I talk about the partners, we have definitely, we have the support of the NTP and the CMU as well, and the support also from the HISP team in the Pakistan. They are really supporting us in customization and other, uh, import, other implementations. So, uh, Need to lead to discuss about the intervention overflow. Uh, we are not uh, implementing as other partners are implementing, like we have a static uh, facility and a one person is in the uh, facility and he is entering the data. We are, uh, our, uh, our intervention is a little different. So in our intervention, when a patient uh, goes to the doctor, a GP, sorry, goes to the GP, so, so GP has to notify that patient to the PPM hub. So our intervention is, uh, we have introduced an, something new in our, our intervention, a PPM hub, that is a call center that is used to facilitate our teams and as well as the real-time notification of the TB cases. So when a patient goes to the GP, the GP's general practitioner will notify the PPM hub about the case. The case that we have the nine call center agents that, uh, that are in the call center agents, they are and entering the data in the DHIS2. When they enter the patient detail into DHIS2, so that a notification is being sent to our DFSs in the field team. So when the, our DFS receives the notification, they then goes to the general protection, the clinic of the GP, so to complete the registration of that patient. After registering the patient and the completing the registration, the next phase is to follow the uh, patients. You know, the TB, uh, TB is a disease that uh, take almost six months to cure. So for this whole process, we have, first we have to register the patients and after that we have the follow-ups. The TB, the PPM have also facilitates in follow-ups of the patient as well. 
if the patient's follow up was uh, on time, the, it is all go good. But when the patient is not show up in the follow up, then DFS, then the PPM hub will all again contact the DFS to go and uh, follow the patient about their follow ups. So uh, this that was our intervention. So how we are implementing in Pakistan to implement this in Pakistan, we started in back in. 2022 in October 2022, and we started the pilot in the intervention. So we piloted in the nine districts, and uh, we have covered almost all the provinces and our implementation partners that eight, eight implementation partners in the Pakistan to test how this intervention goes. So from the pilot, we have registered almost 11,000 cases, and we have engaged uh, almost 5,050 general practitioners, and uh, the users that were entering into the system were almost 35. And the total number of districts we were nine, and we trained them in the pilot. So after the pilot, it goes uh, around almost one year. In October 2023, we start our rollout of the our uh, project. We you can see the projected notification annually are almost 200,000 plus. We have to. You know, register these cases in the private sector. Just as for I mentioned, if we are enrolling almost 400,000 plus cases in Pakistan annually. So half of the cases are reported through the private sector. So you can assume how much, uh, how at the large scale we are entering the data into the systems. You can see it's, it's our update till now. We are, as I mentioned, we are working in the 120 districts. We are almost 87% completed the rollout in the Pakistan, in the private sector. Uh, we, are, we have almost 78% of the user trend and we are mapping also the health facilities that are more than 12,000. Uh, another thing I want to mention here is that we have to uh, map these facilities as I, am, I, I told you that we have the DFS, district field supervisors working in the field, and we have assigned more than one health facilities to the district field supervisors. So this is the change in the intervention, and I will show the challenges also in the next slide. Uh, challenge we are facing, the major challenge is the user management. As I told you, one DFS, one district field supervisor is managing more than one health facilities. Uh, I assume uh, average, you, you can see more than 20 health facilities. So it's not a static health facilities. The P P GP clinics are, they are sometimes one, at one place. Uh, at the other, other time, they can be uh, in another place. So we have to manage how they, how to manage these uh, users to map these facilities so they can enter the data. And uh, you can see, we have another challenge of creation, the user-oriented reports. For example, I want to see the, how my DFS is performing. If I, can, if I cannot see the performance of my field team, so I cannot, uh, so I cannot take the decisions of how it can be good. So beside this, we have another challenge of retro Retrospective data shift when districts were between partners. Uh, this is a, another big challenge. As I mentioned, we have 120 districts and we are implementing with the partners. So when we are implementing with the partners, sometimes a district shifts from one partner to the another partners. What will be what happened? What happened to the cases that were enrolled before one partner and now the district is shift to another partner? So we are also facing this challenge as well, and we have also communicated this to the HISP team. Uh, Another challenge we are facing, it's a requirement of the program is as well, the locking events and the stages in the tracker. Sometimes our field team has to uh, enter the data. As, you, as I mentioned, the TB case, TB treatment takes six months. So if the registration process is completed and the patient show up in the, after, the two, after two months, so what happened to the data they have entered? So we have to make sure they cannot change the data because it affects the total notifications that are already reported. So this is also our challenge, and we also have discussed this with the team, uh, his team. Uh, another thing is the PPM hub CRM interoperability with the patient's record in DHS2. And uh, as I mentioned, the PPM hub is contacting with the patient. Every time the PPM hub contact with the patient, their history is created, and we want in, it into the DHS2 when the person, when the patient data is collected, and we can see a uh, history of the patient. It should be mentioned when a patient is contacted with the 
see with the hub ppm hub when he was enrolled when other time when his follow up was due when the P ppm hub called the patient so uh, we want this history in the dhis2 so this is another challenge for us uh if we go for the way forward yes uh, father also mentioned about the uh, integ integration of the some system so we have the interoperability of the dhis2 with our existing system in the mercy cores uh, uh, private tb program so one of the is active case finding where the chest camps we are uh, conducting the chest camps in our country where we have to find the cases the active case finding of the active tb patients so this is the is this this system is also active in pakistan is beside this we have a riders specimen transportation that is the sputum transportation samples collection and uh, beside this we have a rx tracker pharmacy intervention that is also used to uh, find the tb patients that are still hide from the system and the fourth one is the i mentioned earlier the ppm hub the call center for the real time tb cases notification and follow up so we want these all systems at the one place into the dhis2 so the main purpose of this interoperability will should be the when the all data is at the one place so it will be more feasible the decision makers to make decisions and they can uh, they can generate the reports so it will be more real time data and more they will be capable enough to make the good decisions so we are uh, looking forward to our hisp team ab about this in interoperability and uh, we are hoping we will achieve this by next this year uh if we if we achieve the interoperability after that we have a plan to improve our monitoring in the surveillance system when the data is at the one place and we are getting the reports uh, for our our system so we are hoping to we can get the real time tracking of our patients and beside this we can get the real time analysis of our data so when these both these things we can achieve we can we will have a intelligent data intelligent data i mean to say we will will make the decisions about about the data and we have to uh improve the system as much as we can so the system will tell us about how this can be done so if we can see in the next slide this is the slide we have taken from uh, our com component batch ai and we have set up the dashboard of this uh, system and we are thankful our appcon and the kit team they have developed this so they this system tells us about the hot spots from the system they uh, the indicators they have calculated uh, different parameters from the pakistan now they are predicting the, about the hot spots the system is telling us where should the camp should be conducted and uh, from which uh, indicators they have used so we want this intelligent system just like this system in dhs2 also so we can predict this uh, well, how can we see the uh, future of the tb program so we are uh, we also want this ai system in the dhs2 when we have the, all the system in the one place so we can better manage our tb cases in uh, dhs2 uh, some other important uh, interventions in uh, our usage analytics dashboard we also requested the his team to create a usage analytics dashboard to how dhs2 uh, how our field teams are using the dhs2 and how they are using uh, how many functions they have used uh, very often and very less so we want a user analytic dashboards about how to how we can want our our users to check their performance about the dhs2 we also created a one in uh, manually but we want it, it into the uh, dhis2 so this this data can be reflect from the dhs2 uh, database so we can track the user analytics from the dhs2 another very important thing is the field staff work plan in dhis2 so as i mentioned earlier we have all the when we have all the systems in the one place in the dhis2 so it will be more easy for our dfss to conduct the work plan into dhis2 they have to, they the system will help them to create their daily work plan if, if for example when they have to go for the chest cam when have to they go for the registrations how many patients they have to follow up the so system will tell us about their work plan and uh, i think his team is also working on this uh, work plans also a multiple user interface yes it's another challenge as far mentioned 
earlier the private sector is the different and the public sector is different so public our uh, private sector uh, field staff are requesting us to change the interface of the system they are not very comfortable with the system and they want if we have uh, currently we are facing the system we cannot change because it's a one system where they are both private and the public sector are entering the data but our users they demand us to change this uh, interface so they can feasible what interface they want they can enter the data for this purpose we have conducted a user research so user research how uh, we want to see how the pay, our dfss are see how they can enter the data into the system for this purpose this user research we have created some mock up uh, applications that can you can see and uh, we are we are we will hand over it to the hisp team they can integrate this into the dhis2 so our dfs can uh, enter the data into the dfs uh, into the dhis2 you can see it's this user research this interface you are looking uh, at is it's come from the feedback of our field team uh, currently when we open the tracker we cannot see any dashboard in the system we just see uh, a, a program name and a patient's uh, numbers just but our the field team they just want us to have a dashboard in the tracker not they have to go to the web interface and they can see the dashboard their demand is to see the dashboard their at their android devices so you can see if a patient if they open the when they log in the system they can see this dashboard like how many gps they have how many cases they have how many cases last week they entered into the system if we uh, talk about the registrations, how many registrations, registrations they have pending, like I talk about the uh, PPM hub. If the P GPs notifies the PPM hub, so PPM hub, uh, the DFS have to enroll the patient in the 48 hours. So this is the two, notif two means the pending notifications, they have to complete the notifications. And the 13 overdue means after it's, it means the time is overdue, after the 48 hours, these are the notifications. This These types of, dashboards they want like this follow-ups and also if a patient have to how many patients have the pending follow-ups how many patients have the overdue follow-ups like this these are the dashboards they want and a last if you can see the last my last uh, slide uh, last picture you can see a summary of the data entry at, at, at each stage they they just want if they have entered the data in a stage and they cannot see uh, their data into the in the uh, in overview of the data if they can see this in this form they can change the data if they think there is a mistake they can uh, correct that mistake so they want at each state this type of preview so uh i again request our hisp team and the, uh, that they can help us uh, customize these interfaces thank you thank you everyone great is this working can you hear me yeah Thank you so much. Really exciting to see the public and private uh, sector working together for TB in Pakistan. So for our last presentation, we'll uh, have a different kind of scale. We're talking about a system that's used across many countries. Uh, so we will uh, go through this presentation. Then after this, we'll start to open up for questions. Great. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kayla Stankovitz. I'm a technical advisor at FHI 360, and I'm going to talk about our DHIS2 implementations in a very large HIV project. Um, and I'm going to be talking about our evaluation of the scale up of this system. So um, a little different than some of the previous presentations, but showing what it actually takes from the development of a system once it's developed to reach full utilization from users. So just briefly as background, the EPIC project is an eight year global initiative funded by USAID. And we provide strategic technical assistance to achieve HIV epidemic control. And um, I want to note that we are a large uh, international organization. I think in the plenary this morning, there uh, 
it was mentioned that large international organizations are sometimes not very sustainable, but um, we try to implement sustainable systems by working very closely with our partners on the ground. So we work with hundreds of local organizations that are locally run and locally led. So um, we currently operate in 41 countries, and all of these countries use DHIS2 in um, different aspects of their work. Um, our funders reporting system is Datum, which is based in DHIS2, and then our aggregate reporting system is also Datum. But a number of countries also use DHIS2 tracker to collect data at the point of care. So you can see there's 17 countries listed here that um, we're currently supporting uh, to capture DHIS2 individual level tracker data for HIV. And um, when we started working on EPIC, most of our countries were using paper-based systems. So these are actually some of the records that um, we use in the Dominican Republic. And I, th I think everyone is familiar with the challenges of paper-based systems. But um, specifically for HIV, one of the big challenges is tracking people over time. So um, unlike TB, which can be, we heard, could be cured in six months, HIV is a chronic disease. It's something that you'll live with for the rest of your life. But uh, if you're on treatment regularly, you can actually prevent uh, yourself from developing advanced disease, and you can actually prevent yourself from transmitting the disease to other people. So staying on treatment is really, really important. And tracking people over time and supporting their treatment journeys is really challenging when all of their data about the services they've accessed is on paper. So that's one of the reasons that we really wanted to make these systems electronic. So here are some of the benefits of electronic information systems that kind of counteract those challenges from the previous slide. And again, I won't read all of these, but if we were to use the same anecdote, um, Using an electronic system, you're much. Uh, it's much easier to track that individual who is on treatment. It's easy to see who um, who is due to pick up their pills and hasn't come in yet, and who might need extra support for adherence and ongoing um, treatment uh, treatment continuation. So um, over the last five years, we supported the rollout and scale up of DHIS2 Tracker in 17 countries. And it looks like some of my countries are being cut off here, but um, we analyzed data in 15 countries. In two of the countries, we couldn't get the data needed for this analysis because of um, localization laws. Um, so they weren't willing to share the scale up data, which is um, completely fine. So our analysis question was, once a DHIS2 system is developed, how long does it take for teams to use it regularly or to scale it up? And this question was important to us because we have a number of stakeholders who don't necessarily understand how technology adoption works. Um, people... People thought that once we developed these systems and spent time with users customizing the systems, that we would immediately have perfect data and that we would be able to use that data for decision making immediately. And that, that I'm sure we all know that that's not the reality. There's a lot of work that goes into supporting the scale up and utilization of a health management information system. And I actually, this, a colleague, send me a message uh, about this last week and I got this message and I was like, I'm gonna put this in my PowerPoint. Um, but uh, in relation to a new project that we have, um, I had sent a budget for what it would take to scale up a system in, in one of our new countries. And they said, this estimate looks okay, um, but we don't need a budget for the ongoing user support. Once they're trained, they'll be fine. And I, that, that's kind of the situation we're working in, right? So I wanted to do this analysis to help demonstrate what does it really take to scale up a system in terms of time. So um, to analyze these data, we used a time to event analysis. So the purpose of time to event analysis is to analyze the time taken for a specific event to occur. So this um, analysis method is often used um, 
it's called survival analysis, and it's often used to to understand how long people will survive when given a certain treatment or drug. But in this case, we're not talking about anything um, as morbid as death. We're just talking about how long does it take to scale up our system. So um, in this case, we define scale as reaching 95% of the clients supported by the program in a given month. So we estimated um, based on our historic records, which were counted based on those paper records um, in the past, to understand what those what our current reach was. And then we defined the program as reaching scale as uh, getting to that 95% or higher and then maintaining that over time. So, and then time zero was defined as when the system was rolled out to end users. So um, all of the development of the system came before time zero in this scenario. And um, so this analysis can help us predict the probability of an event occurring at a certain time. So in this case, it's telling us, um, it's giving us an estimate of the time frame that it takes to scale up a system. So um, just to note, this wasn't um, the scenario my, my colleague mentioned where we just provided training and then um, let them go and scale up on their own. Um, we did train people to use the systems and devices. We, um, in most cases, we tried to identify a champion in each of our local organizations to help um, push the project forward. We uh, held regular data review meetings to understand utilization and uh, understand and use the data to improve the project. And we provided ongoing supportive supervision to help people become comfortable with these tools. Oh, this one looks real, real funny. Apologies. Um, but this is just the sample distribution. What I want to point out here is um, we worked in nine African countries, six Asian countries, and um, the number of clients over time, uh, the smallest country reached uh, just under 2,000 clients a year, and the largest country reached, I think this was around 300,000 clients a year. So um, the scale of these different country programs uh, was quite different. And then we worked with local partners in each country, and the countries ranged from only um, four partners to 46 partners. So again, you can you can see what scaling up a system would look like in those those different scenarios. So um, the results of our analysis, we found that it took on average 7.6 months um, to enroll greater than 95% of the clients in the system. And our range uh, was four to 12 months. So this graph shows you um, the number of months since the launch of the DHIS2 tracker um, on the x-axis and the percent of the projects that have reached scale at that month on the y-axis. So you can see at four months, um, only one country had reached scale. And then over time, by 12 months, all, um, all of our 15 countries had reached our definition of scale. Um, we also did our analysis um, by those other uh, factors that I mentioned, the population served and the uh, number of partners. So we found that it took um, a longer time to reach scale if you served a very large population greater than 20,000 clients or more had more than 10 partners. And those graphs are shown there as well. So um, we also did a survey to solicit feedback on um, our DHIS2 systems across countries. And I, I think these challenges are really similar to what um, the other presenters spoke to. Um, we had a lot of challenges with system downtime, um, lack of timely support because uh, we're providing support across a number of countries and it's um, it's somewhat, our support systems are somewhat centralized. And then unrealistic stakeholder expectations about what it takes to scale up this kind of system. So um, just briefly, conclusions and next steps. We found that all projects were able to reach scale, um, but the range of time that it took to do so varied quite a bit from four to 12 months. And we hope that this can inform other projects attempting to deploy DHIS2 Tracker. Um, people can use this to advocate that 
technology adoption does not happen overnight and we you need to apply the appropriate amount of time and support to ensure that these systems are sustainable over time. Um, it has really, DHIS2 has really proved an efficient and easy to use option for um, us to transition from these paper-based records to electronic systems. Um, however, the, the time and um, resources that it takes um, was not fully recognized by some of our stakeholders. So um, we need to do a better job of communicating that upfront. Um, and I think hopefully we'll, we'll come back next year and do some further evaluation um, on the impact of implementing these systems. Um, some of my colleagues actually spoke at previous sessions today about this, but um, we're, we're hoping now that we have uh, better data to do a lot more um, analysis around impact. Let's see, that might be it. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, I'm being strangled by this microphone. Um, great, thank you so much for that presentation. And also uh, thanks to the presenters for agreeing to reduce your time a bit. So we actually did reserve 20 minutes for questions. So I'm going to ask the presenters to come join me up here. We have a couple of different microphones. And Kwame, can I ask you to help pass this around? We have online participants, and this is the only way they can hear the questions. And then it will be handy because you'll have a microphone, so you can make whatever comment you want. That's how far is this? Yes, so questions. Go ahead, and I'm going to start looking online as well to see if we have questions. All right, so as Kwame makes it up the stairs, we do have a first question uh, about patient unique IDs. Um, let's see, I'm not sure if I can tell to which specific presenter this was, but it looks like it came across uh, near the beginning. So let's say unique IDs. How do you handle that in the immunization system? I'll take that. Ah, great. Kwame can handle that. Yes. Um, thank you very much. So um, I think globally, unique IDs is one of the issues that a lot of countries are battling with. Um, in Ghana, we are using a, a multi-layered approach because Ghana is, is still in the process of getting unique ID, national unique IDs. So um, the average adult in Ghana possibly have about six biometric IDs, six different biometric IDs. Um, the plan is to move towards getting a single unique ID for each citizen in Ghana. Until we get there, we need to adopt a multi-layered approach where in registration, we have to adopt two or three different um, IDs depending on the target population we are looking at. And the expectation is that at least each client will present one of the listed IDs, which can be used as a, um, a unique identifier when the client's information is being retrieved from the system. So that is how we are dealing with uh, the issue of unique IDs. Thanks. I don't know, do others want to respond? Uh, definitely. Um, so uh, just to add to what our colleague has said, uh, when we are talking about unique identifiers, we have to keep in mind that uh, it all depends on the uh, disease we are targeting and uh, the stigma associated with the disease because uh, not all patients are comfortable with identifying themselves, especially if you are talking about HIV. Um, sometimes in case of TB and malaria as well, they are not comfortable. So what do we do? Uh, do we go with the national ID? In case of Ghana, we have multiples. In case of Pakistan, we have singular national ID. They might not present. Then what can be used? We have uh, different identifiers like contact numbers. We have um, CNIC contact numbers and then names and father names and mother names. We can triangulate those and make an ID out of that. But uh, all these combinations, uh, they are all dependent on the nature of disease and the implementation that's being done in Pakistan. But we have is we didn't uh, go with the uh, strictly following the national identity, identity card, the, the CNIC. Uh, but uh, we are uh, focusing in terms of HIV uh, to go for facial recognition so that it can be uh, more uh, uh, fr uh, fruitful for us. That's different. 
Yeah, I mean, I I think you took the words out of my mouth. Um, there, uh, HIV, especially the populations that we work with, it's it's really challenging to apply something like a national ID number because um, many of the populations we work with are criminalized in the countries that we work. So um, it's it, it's criminalized to inject drugs or participate in sex work. So um, we usually use a triangulation of multiple different factors to create some kind of unique ID for each person, and it varies by country. Yeah. All right, so my question is, I'm interested to know, uh, what parameters were you looking at when determining the scale factor? Because you might have, for example, in Malawi, we have cases whereby uh, you've deployed your tracker program, but after training the users, when now it's actually in the production, uh, the production phase, you might find that uh, the service providers have dumped the trackers, have, have dumped, the, they are no longer using the tracker program. So you might say that uh, we've managed to roll out 98% of the country. Yes, you've done that, but the actual system users uh, less than 50%. So I'm just interested to know the parameters. Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I think that it's it's really challenging because even if you have 95% of the people in the system, that doesn't mean that the data are of high quality or that you'll continue to have that kind of utilization over time. Um, we, we use 95% and, um, the number of people reached overall as a proxy because we didn't have a better measurement. Um, but, uh, and we definitely did see some countries where that, um, that utilization fell off over time. The reality is our project has very, very strong reporting requirements. Um, they're very challenging to meet. So we have to report 50 some indicators every month to our headquarters and then um, even more indicators quarterly to our funder. So um, using the system really, really streamlines that reporting process and therefore motivates people to continue using it. Um, and when utilization drops, it's noticed very quickly because we are reviewing our data regularly. Um, but I, I think those are probably ongoing challenges in every setting. Maybe to piggyback on that for the Mercy Corps colleague, it talked about usage analytics and wanting to have better insight into the use of the system. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about kind of the metrics that you're looking for in order to show utilization and, and make sure that the system is having the reach that you intended. Yes, uh, as I earlier mentioned, we have the district field supervisors. We have to check their performance. Uh, we want to see the, how there are so many functions in the DHS to how many functions they are using the daily basis, they are using on the weekly basis. And also we have provided them tablets. So we want to check how how many times they have uh, in how many times they have a login to the system and they are entering the data. So we have also we also want to uh, track the delays in the system. For example, if we want we talk about the real-time notifications that the patient is getting registered and how how much it take the system, how much it take the DFSs to register uh, the complete the registration. So we have want to calculate that delays and the calculate the delays of the follow-ups of the patients. So we want these types of analytics in the system to uh, dashboard to, so, uh, from which we, we can see the performance of the teams and uh, we can better make the sequence for the programs. Uh, hi, uh, great presentation, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Atra Saeed. Uh, I, I have a broader question, uh, uh, and any one of you can can answer it. Uh, so, what's the long term vision of of incorporating these vertical programs uh, into the the provincial level or the national level DHIS two or any other health management information system which are running in, in these particular uh, respective countries? Uh, uh, and the reason I'm asking is uh, this would help definitely uh, in. Uh, correlating it with the other data that that's being captured within the health spheres, as well as the policy making, high level policy making. Yeah. 
So, um, uh, if I got your correct uh, question correctly, uh, you're talking about how much time it does it take from the provincial systems to get integrated into the national system? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, if you're talking about the vision, it should be uh, one system, one country, one system. That's the end vision. Because we are talking about patients, we are talking about uh, human beings. We are talking about one patient that uh, one human being that can have multiple diseases uh, across the lifespan. So, the vision is to have one system uh, that captures the uh, information from the birth of the human to the death and all diseases should be captured over there and uh, that is the end goal uh, as you're talking about the vertical programs uh, currently in uh, if you're talking about pakistan we have uh, integration being done for three diseases so for aids tuberculosis and malaria on a single platform and uh, we are talking at the patient level, we are uh, moving towards uh, linking uh, tuberculosis and HIV as well for case-based surveillance. So tracking patients across multiple diseases. Uh, moving towards that, um, it is important to have a singular system. Here, I just want to add one more thing. Uh, we talk about integrations. It is a very good thing. We are talking about integrations. I, I'll reiterate what I said earlier. Uh, integrations have their own challenges. Having separate systems, um, they are there uh, from the start and they are performing well. But when we are talking about a country level implementation, we are talking about a singular system. It has its disadvantages. Uh, integrations are always helpful, but uh, with, they come with their own challenges. And we have to make sure that if we have a chance to get on a singular platform, a singular scale, a single health, health information system, please take that. <laughs> Do not go for the integrations unless and it is uh, required. I was going to ask you, Kwame, to also comment from Ghana because I know you've done a lot of work in this area. Yes. Um, so um, for us, I definitely support what um, my brother said. Um, if you are looking at having multiple systems, it definitely comes with a lot of challenges. Integration is fine. I mean, systems can integrate. We, we can't deny that. But the question is that who gets the data into the system? So you have all these different diseases being managed in one health facility by the same health staff. Everybody wants to send a different system to that same health facility. We have instances where different programs send different electronic gadgets to these facilities. So you go to one facility and you have a tablet or a computer for TB, another one for malaria, a third one for HIV. Everybody has that. Meanwhile, you only have two people working in this health facility. So the best approach should be getting a system that can deal with all the challenges that we have as much as possible so that the same health staff can manage one digital tool, one system, and still get whatever we need, answer all the questions, across diseases. That, I think, is a better approach. Because we have, in our case, we've had instances where you get to the health facility, there are five different tablets sitting there. The health staff is only working with one. The rest of the four are just lying there, and they are redundant. So we are also pushing for getting one system that is as comprehensive as possible, that can answer most of the questions. We might not get a system that can answer all questions. But as much as possible, we should lean towards getting a system that deals with most of the issues. And then we can have a few ones here and there to deal with some of the things which are outside the scope of the, the current system. So that is the approach we are currently using. We have tried a couple of integrations and they always come with problems because when one system changes in, when there are slight changes in one system, you should as well consider making changes in the other systems too. And so, you know, these systems also evolve very fast. So you need to catch up with the, you know, evolution. And it's quite tedious if you have to do that. So I agree, one system dealing with as many diseases as possible so that we wouldn't have that challenge of having to deal with the evolution systems and all that. Wow. 
And I'll, I'll take this time to put in a plug for tomorrow's session, Tracker for Health. There is going to be some examples from countries of how they're trying to approach it. And I would also say that from DHS2, we're not trying to be that only one system. There's a lot of integration efforts that are worth doing, and there's a lot of realities on the ground. But I do really value the perspective of that clinic that has two people, what is their experience? So I think that's really important to consider when you're doing this system designs. I think we have a question back there and while you, oh, there already. All right. And then we have one online and then maybe back. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Abdurrahman Mohamed. I have a question for the Ghana team on the EPI. So so we have an issue in, in our country we are supporting where we are looking for how best we can be able to track the last mile distribution for especially vaccines. We really have a lot of wastage and uh, to cover that, so we wanted to understand how best uh, we can be able to track. But I see you have done a tracker for EPI within the DHS too. So uh, how far has it gone? Is it only uh, tracking the supplies at the warehouse level or even at facility, even at the cold chain level? Uh, so I wanted to understand that, thank you. Uh, in fact, I'm getting too many questions today. So yes, um, <laughs> so with um, logistics, um, in Ghana, we are currently having a hybrid. We are dealing with two systems. We have what we call the GILMIS. That's a Ghana um, integrated logistics management system, which is used to deal with the, the logistics management you know, process. So right from the warehouse down to the health facilities. Then we are using the DHIS2 to capture the immunization you know, data. The challenge we are currently facing is that one system is dealing with the supply chain, another system is dealing with the service. And we are having difficulty trying to get the two systems to speak to each other so that um, you can always get a one stop to analyze the data, like looking at service against logistics. So that is a challenge we are currently um, dealing with. We are, I, I, I think we have to, I don't know if I should call it um, a revolution in Ghana, because we are trying to see how we can adopt the logistics model within the DHIS2. There is a package to see how we can deploy that um, currently. If we do that, it means that we are going to abandon one of the systems. And you know how political, um, these things can be sometimes. So we are going to attempt to do that, but we know we are going to face a lot of, you know, challenges, but we'll see how it goes. Maybe next year we can report on um, whether we've been successful or not, but. I will say standing at the back is uh, George, who can be somebody that you can talk to about the supply chain and last mile. That's specifically what they're focusing on. And I don't know if Breno's in here, but also, uh, Yes, thank you. So just a uh, contribution um, with the Ghana team. I think uh, one of the things uh, we keep asking ourselves, and it should probably be a question we should, be, we should all be asking, is when are we supposed to integrate, right? We are users of DHIS2. Of course, it comes with its limitations, but it also has functionalities that can solve a lot of the day-to-day -day needs of health facilities and health systems across the country. But what we also see is that there is a lot of duplication that is going on both with country systems and also with partner support. So that partners get into countries, there are already existing efforts traditionally being uh, tried out and being, uh, uh, they are trying to scale it up. And partners get in and then they go start something else somewhere. And then at the end of the day, you have three, four competing systems virtually doing the same thing. And the most difficult part is that the point of entry is at the managerial level. And so they meet all the decision makers, the decision is making uh, made there, then they expect that technically that gets implemented now. So it puts technical implementers against the managers 
where managers have agreed at the top level with partners that, oh, this can be implemented. They get to the implementation, then the technical people say, oh, but this could be done on the existing systems. Why are we duplicating? Then the first question is this. You do not want remote interoperability. And it ties into the question of when the fact that the systems are operable, interoperable, doesn't mean that we must implement 10 systems and then integrate. We are simply shifting the problem. And it gets complicated because anytime there is a break, it affects all the systems and it gets a bit more difficult to implement and then manage. Thank you. Okay. I, unfortunately, we're out of time now, but maybe that opened enough topics that you can carry into the networking session after this. But a big round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much for presenting.